On this site, a powerful engine will be built. This could be the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Let's explore it together. More than 12 million televisions tuned in to Enterprise when it debuted on the United Paramount Network September 26, 2001. It may not have been titled a Star Trek show, but just a glance at the first Starship Enterprise designated NX-01 was enough to let you know that while it might be a different time than Next Generation, Voyager, or Deep Space Nine, we were still going where no one had gone before. And that place was back to the beginning to a time before all of its predecessor shows, including the original series. Enterprise would be the first Star Trek prequel, and it was prepared to explore Starfleet in its infancy and give fans a view of what the Star Trek universe looked like between the events of First Contact and the original series. To explore a time before the formation of the Federation, when a Starfleet captain might ask for Warp 5.2 and not be certain the ship wouldn't come apart. But before the fourth Star Trek show in a decade could air on television and continue the golden age of the franchise, there were a few problems that needed to be addressed. Forget that the studio couldn't keep their fingers out of the soup, or that this new Enterprise didn't have a captain even though production was about to begin. Or how about the fact that the showrunners didn't even want to make the show? <laughs> yes, really. This is the story of a reluctant Star Trek show that struggled to survive, would eventually find its stride, to only be struck down before its time. This is the story of Star Trek Enterprise, and you've never heard it told like this before. So you don't want to miss this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please do so now. And give us a thumbs up if you want more inside knowledge about your favorite shows. And make sure you stay tuned to the end to see how to get this awesome NX-01 inspired graphic design. TV show called Enterprise, pretty easy bet that it's a Star Trek show. When CBS television CEO Les Moonves canceled Enterprise at the end of its fourth season, it would end an 18-year revival of Star Trek on television and send the franchise into the Dark Ages. It would also mean the end for one of the most important people in Star Trek outside of creator Gene Roddenberry himself. Rick Berman had been the guiding hand of Star Trek since 1989 when he took over as the sole executive producer of Star Trek The Next Generation as Roddenberry's health declined. One wouldn't think Berman to be the first choice for Roddenberry to help him create The Next Generation. Berman wasn't a fan of science fiction. He only vaguely recalls one or two episodes of Star Trek he'd seen as a kid. Needing a crash course on Star Trek, Berman was personally mentored by Roddenberry on the rules of Star Trek and vowed never to break them. This is one of the main reasons Star Trek didn't deviate from Roddenberry's vision after his death. Someone who had a strong affinity for Star Trek may have tried to apply their vision to the franchise, but not Berman. Before we share why Berman wouldn't change Roddenberry's vision, make sure you stay tuned until later in the show, where we'll show you why Backblaze will protect every electronic thing you value. Whatever you're about to say, I don't want to hear it. Just get me a shirt. Berman never wanted to change Star Trek. He honestly felt like the foundation of Star Trek was Roddenberry's vision, and he studied it like a foreign language. As far as Berman was concerned, the future of humanity would be one of hope, and every command would be led by a strong captain with a capable crew trying their best to uphold those ideals. For future shows, Berman wanted episodic Star Trek that followed in the vein of the next generation. And for the most part, Berman would accomplish this task despite writers and showrunners frequently wanting to do something different. Berman had incredible success. Before Enterprise, he was responsible for more than 500 episodes and three Star Trek movies. Had any other live action TV and movie franchise ever been as successful as Star Trek up until this point? Of course not, pull up a chair. The answer is no, and not even close. At more than six billion movie and TV dollars earned, it's not even close. So could anything slow down the Rick Berman Star Trek train? It's continuing mission. 
It doesn't matter how fast your horse is or how many races it wins. If you don't give it a break every once in a while, it's going to come up lame and that will be the end of your horse. In June 1999, following the end of the fifth season of Voyager, UPN approached Berman about producing another Star Trek series. They wanted it to overlap with Voyager in the same way Deep Space Nine had done with The Next Generation and Voyager with DS9. But Berman was reluctant. He was quoted many times saying, you could take too many trips to the well, that you can squeeze too many eggs out of the golden goose. But the executives didn't want to hear any of that. They made it clear that if Berman couldn't take care of the goose, they'd find someone else who could. Studio people. Berman wasn't ready to turn over the reins of Star Trek, so he turned to Brandon Braga. Braga had helped produce 192 episodes of The Next Generation and Voyager with him, so he asked him to help create the next series. Braga said yes, but the truth was, he was burnt out on Star Trek. In a 2021 interview with Den of Geek, Braga said he couldn't do this anymore, referring to Star Trek. He said he could remember where he was and what he was working on when he said he was officially burnt out. He left Voyager before the seventh season, believing the franchise always needs fresh blood. When Berman called Braga and asked him to work on a new series, he said yes. But was Braga ready to strap on the Star Trek feedback once again, or was his creativity still recovering? Despite what happened with Enterprise, Braga is a Star Trek legend and a proven producer. In recent years, his work on 24, Salem, and the Orville is top-notch work. Definitely worth the wait. But Braga admits that when they were shooting the pilot for Enterprise and it was time for him to start writing again, the ship set sail and Braga felt constrained. He told Den of Geek, here we go again. He admitted to feeling very challenged. It was also the first time he wasn't working with people he'd worked with before. Enterprise was a large staff of 10 people, and Braga would say that Star Trek was notoriously difficult to find writers for because it was a hard show to write. It was unique and had to have a specific voice, and he had a totally new staff that was completely new to the genre. Braga would eventually reflect that perhaps he shouldn't have joined Berman for this one final trek. Berman, believing that Star Trek burnout was a real thing for fans, was able to convince the studio to at least wait until Voyager was over before launching Enterprise. But with 12 million people watching that first episode, perhaps Berman was more afraid that the people making Star Trek was burnout, because the fans had shown up. If you make good Star Trek, they will keep coming back. Braga was right to be concerned. By the end of the first season, more than 8 million viewers had walked away from the show. Make it Star Trek that was closer to people today. After UPN ordered up a new show, Berman was perplexed on when or where the show would take place. What could they do that was different? They had done three shows that took place in the 24th century, so Rick thought it was time to go to another century. Braga loved Berman's idea to explore a time when the first humans were going into warp capable vessels. A time when they weren't as sure of themselves as Kirk or Picard. A time when they were taking baby steps. There would be no holodecks or people beaming themselves all over the place. It seemed like a good idea to both of them, and so they pursued it. While fans thought that perhaps a Starfleet Academy series was in development, the two showrunners never even considered another idea. But like the idea as much as they did, it was another thing to get the studio to buy off on it. According to Braga, they were dubious about the prequel idea when they pitched it to them. Braga said he didn't think they liked it very much. They thought Star Trek should be about moving forward and not backward. To convince the studio, they started asking them questions like, how did we end up with the first warp ship? What was it like to meet a Klingon for the first time? Eventually the studio would relent, but they put their foot down firmly about their second idea. The showrunners wanted to spend the first season of Enterprise on Earth showing the human-Vulcan relationship and the difficulty getting Enterprise ready to go. But the studio heads wouldn't hear of it. The pilot could be on Earth, but Star Trek was in space, so get there by the end of the first episode. Berman and Braga wanted Enterprise to be more character-driven than previous series and hoped that this would gain viewers who had watched The Next Generation but had lost interest with Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Berman wanted to see humanity when they are truly going where no one has gone before. He wanted to see people who didn't take meeting aliens as just another part of the job. Also, by bringing the series back 200 years from Voyager, it meant the characters would be closer to the present, and by doing that, they can be a little bit more accessible and more familiar to fans watching the show. Once the studio greenlit the series, it was time to get the new series moving. 
But who would be our new 22nd century crew? We're going to stumble, make mistakes, I'm sure more than a few before we find our footing. You gotta figure out who the captain is. That's the most important thing. Up until Enterprise, there had been four key captain leads for Star Trek shows. Each of them had strengths and weaknesses, but the one thing they all shared in common is their belief in Starfleet, the Federation, and humanity's place among the stars. With Jonathan Archer, we get a captain who initially isn't certain of humanity's future. He isn't even certain if Starfleet will survive their Vulcan overlords. But in Archer, we see the beginnings of the ideology we take for granted in other captains. Doing what seems like the right thing no matter what the cost and despite the odds. Archer is a raw version of the captains we'd come to love, and they would need someone special to fit into those shoes and lead the series. Enter Scott Stewart Bakula. He was already a science fiction legend, leaping through time in our TVs way back in 1989 as Dr. Sam Beckett, striving to put right what once went wrong. Oh boy. Bakula had earned a Golden Globe and four Emmy nominations for Best Actor, as well as five consecutive viewers for Quality Television Awards for Best Actor in a Quality Drama Series. Quantum Leap was a huge hit for the science fiction community, and Star Trek fans were excited when they found out Bakula would be the first captain of the Enterprise. The problem was, everyone producing the show wasn't sure he would take the job. And Berman wanted him so bad, he didn't even consider another choice. So when the show was only days from starting production and the Enterprise didn't have a captain, there were concerns. Ironically, Bakula found out about the Enterprise role while he was pitching an entirely different science fiction show. It was a show his friend Dave Fuller had written, the same guy who had written Necessary Roughness for Bakula to star in. The studio executives listened, but Bakula remembers the room being lukewarm about the idea. He was a year and a half into a production deal with Paramount, and they had been looking for a project for him to do. They said, we're not going to go forward with this idea, and the reason why is, we're going to do a new Star Trek show, and we want you to be the captain. Bakula's first thought was that he didn't want to do it because he didn't want to follow the four captains before him. When they explained it was taking place 100 years before Kirk, in his mind he was already hooked. Also, the guys who wanted him to do the show had a relationship with him at Universal Television when he was doing Quantum Leap, so that was also part of what made Bakula want to do the show. As much as he wanted to do the show, there were a few things that kept him from signing the contract, making everyone nervous right up until production. Bakula had already made a pilot for CBS where he was the lead in a comedy series called Late Bloomers. But more than that, if Bakula was going to do Star Trek, he wanted to feel everyone was going to work together to make the show a good experience. He also wanted to make a good deal. It was reported at the time of Bakula's announcement that he was making a small fortune to star in Enterprise, and he had also been given a level of creative involvement he requested. He wanted to be able to give significant input to the script and his character for each episode. An agreement was made on May 10, 2001, and production began on May 14. Enterprise had her new captain. But what about the first officer? Should you still want to tag along? It's only logical. When producers were trying to figure out the cast for the new show, they knew they wanted a Vulcan. According to Braga, they were looking for a Vulcan babe like Savik, specifically the Kim Cattrall Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country version. They wanted a Vulcan on board because the Vulcans were especially antagonistic toward humans at this time, and she would essentially be a chaperone, which was going to drive Archer crazy. And for the original series fans, it was going to be a Vulcan they were pretty familiar with. Enterprise's Vulcan was going to be Tapa, who most fans will remember from the original series episode Amok Time, where at 145 years old, she served in her capacity as a priestess officiating at Spock's formal wedding. This younger version of the character would be the perfect age for Enterprise. Even casting calls were referring to that character by that name, and at one time Babylon 5 actress Marjorie Monaghan was being considered for the role of sub-commander to Paul. Then they ran into a snag. As it turned out, Theodore Sturgeon, who wrote Amok Time, owned the rights to the character he created, and since that created legal issues, they decided to go with a new character to Paul. And for a time, producers considered making Tapa to Paul's sister to unite the women in history. But eventually, the idea was dropped. 
The Enterprise did find a way to eventually use T'Pol's character during three episodes where she was an extremist who demanded the government return to Surak's teachings. But casting for T'Pol would prove difficult as the crew had seen hundreds of actresses. The main issue is that Berman wanted a beautiful woman who could act and didn't want to move right into feature films. When Berman found Jolene Blaylock, she came in with no makeup on and he said she didn't look great but he could see there was a remarkable potential. The supervising producer asked her to put on some makeup and come back in for another reading because they had seen her in other clips and she was stunning. When she came back in, Berman said she nailed it. They had their T'Pol. Blaylock had been bouncing around TV show episodes for a couple years before her fateful Enterprise audition. Prior to that, she had been modeling in Europe and Asia since she was 17 until she was finally bit by the acting bug. Blaylock was excited to get the role for Enterprise as a Vulcan because she was a self-proclaimed nerd and huge original series fan. And of course, her favorite character was Spock and she was very familiar with Vulcans. Although, had the role been for Deep Space Nine or Voyager, she may not have taken it. She told Howard Stern on his show in May 2002 that she would have turned down the role of T'Pol if it had been for either of the other shows. But when she learned Enterprise would feature a younger cast, she thought it was worth it. She also said she was happy that she looked so different in her T'Pol wig and makeup than she did in real life so she wouldn't be typecast in the future. This fear would end up being misplaced as Enterprise would end up being the only recurring main cast role she'd receive in her whole career. Blaylock would eventually become a vocal critic of the work being done on Enterprise, but more on that in a moment. First, who would play the first engineer for the USS Enterprise? Before we show you why Trip Tucker was almost played by another actor than the one you remember, let me first quickly tell you why you are going to love this video sponsor, Backblaze. How many priceless photos, videos, and documents do you have stored on your computer? Now imagine losing all of it if anything happens to your system. This is why Backblaze is the only backup service we trust with our personal and business content. Backblaze is not only the best, most secure, and trusted backup system in the industry, but it is also the most affordable. At only $7 a month, protect everything on your Mac or PC. Yes, we mean everything, including videos, and it's unlimited. Other services charge twice as much as Backblaze for this service, and they don't even give you everything. Back up your files all over the world and access that data on the go with their iOS and Android apps. With daily automatic backups of all your files, you never have to worry or even think about protecting your content again. Backblaze has restored over 55 billion files for their customers. This offers you protection from fires, floods, and the terrifying blue screen of death. Backblaze is recommended by Macworld, PC World, Wired, The New York Times, and more. Whoever you're using now just isn't good enough. Get a fully featured 15-day no credit card required free trial at backblaze.com slash the popcast. Worried about accidentally deleting files? For an extra $2 a month, you can increase your retention history to one year. Don't be that person who forgot to back up their important files. Backblaze has your back. Click on the link in the description below and start protecting yourself at a price you can afford today. I can't change the laws of physics. There's only one Mr. Scott, and one of the most memorable things about him besides working miracles for Captain Kirk is his charming Scottish accent. Well, apparently he wasn't the first charming chief engineer with an accent. Enterprise would feature Trip Tucker, a longtime friend of Captain Archer with a southern twang to go with his southern charm. In the producer's eyes, Tucker would round out the main three characters. They would be this generation's version of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. The only problem is, the studio didn't want the guy who was going to play him. Connor Trenier had been on the acting scene for four years when Enterprise opened up. He'd played one-off roles on a variety of TV shows, including an episode of Sliders. Trenier admitted to bombing his first audition for Trip. Not having his lines down well, he was allowed to go out and work on his audition and come back in an hour. He didn't feel like he did well on the second audition either, but he was invited back to a third audition, this time with Braga in the room. Trenier felt like he nailed it. He was invited back for a fourth and fifth audition, and he felt like he nailed those too. But after the last audition, they told him they weren't getting enough awe from him as Trip Tucker, thinking he wasn't going to get the role. Connor went to Mexico for the weekend to drown his sorrows. Trenier wasn't wrong. The studio did not want him for the role and made Berman audition another actor whom Berman called a pretty boy type. He wasn't the Tucker that Berman wanted though. 
For the next several days, Berman bugged Gary Hart, who was the president of the studio. Berman would famously say that Connor was the only actor in all four Star Trek television series that he had to fight for. Berman loved him. He had seen four pieces of tape on various things he'd done and felt like he was made for the role of Trip Tucker. Eventually, Hart would relent and let Berman hire Trenier for the role. Berman would say that Trenier was one of his favorite actors in all of the Star Trek shows. Trenier would go on to play in a recurring role as Michael in Stargate Atlantis, but to this day, Enterprise is what he is most known for. Charles Trip Tucker III would end up playing the fiery, emotional opposite to T'Pol and contribute to a few steamy scenes on the show. But if Tucker was the hardest character to cast, who was the easiest? Indeed. Well, then I imagine this will be the last time we meet. Dominic Keating had previously auditioned for a role on Voyager two years before Enterprise. He was up for the role of the prince of a nomadic space tribe, and he thought he had the role, but the call never came. Little did Keating know that Berman thought he would be great for Enterprise and didn't want to waste him on Voyager. Keating had no idea he had won the part of Malcolm Reed almost two years before Enterprise came out. It wasn't until the end of the first season of Enterprise when Berman was on the set because they were shooting Star Trek Nemesis next door. Berman was chatting with Keating between setups and told him that he had remembered him from his Voyager audition and he'd had Keating's picture on his desk for two years while formulating Enterprise. Keating was surprised and told Berman, you could have given me a call. You have no idea what those two years were like. He was working during those two years, but his most notable appearance was on an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I know what your face wants. The character of Malcolm came from a long line of Royal Navy men, but joined Starfleet because of his fear of drowning. Malcolm is a pretty button-up character who keeps most of his thoughts to himself. When Keating read the description of his wry, by-the-book, and shy-around-women character, he said, crap, I've got to act this. But there was a moment when Keating wasn't so sure he was going to get the role. He had been struggling to find the right English accent for the character. Braga wanted the character to sound blue-collar. Unable to find an accent that the producer liked, Keating was afraid the role was slipping away. So he asked if he could try it with his own natural accent. And it was perfect. With tactical in place, who would be at the helm of the first Enterprise? Berman wanted the Enterprise cast to be young. And for his new helmsman, Travis Mayweather, he wanted a young African-American man. It was important to the producers that people watching the show would be able to connect with this younger audience. Anthony Montgomery was exactly who Berman was looking for. Young, handsome, and charming. Montgomery described being a part of the show as incredible. There was an electricity that just ran up my core and it was because I was sitting at the helm of a show, being a part of a franchise that I grew up with and knew about. Montgomery wasn't a Trekkie, but he understood enough about Star Trek for it to be a wow factor. And this wasn't Anthony's first interaction with Star Trek. Three years earlier, he auditioned for a role on Star Trek Voyager, but didn't get the part. Casting director Ron Surma liked him so much that he brought him back to read for the part of Tuvok's son on a different Voyager episode. He didn't get that part either, but both of those attempts was part of the reason he ended up on Enterprise. Surma liked Montgomery and once again brought him back to read for Travis Mayweather, and the producers loved him. Berman would go on to say Anthony talked himself into the role on the first day. But who else would be joining him on the bridge? We use a device called the Universal Translator. Producers wanted the communications officer to go back to a little listening device like Uhura had in the original series. They were specifically looking for an Asian actor to play the role. They wanted someone to be a translator with almost magical abilities. They also wanted someone vulnerable who wasn't into flying on spaceships. So when Linda Park came into audition, she nailed the role of Hashi Soto on the first try. But Park had come into the audition with the role pretty much already hers. She had appeared in a show opposite Anthony Montgomery in the WB series Popular, and producers fell in love with her. The role was actually going to be an older character until she got the part. Hoshi would spend a large part of the show written off to the side of the show's central action. One of her feature starring episodes was Vanishing Point, which she was literally fading out of existence. But when the show finally got to the Mirror Universe episodes, Hoshi would come into her own. You're speaking with Empress Sato. But what character would she spend most of her time with on Enterprise? This is Dr. Flops. Your captivity in Decon is over. Producers were looking for a wise, quirky alien to play the role of the Doctor on Enterprise. The guy they would choose to play the role was once a frail, ill boy with a noticeable lisp. 
he was cast as Scrooge in his fifth grade class production of A Christmas Carol. Fast forward 31 years later and John Billingsley would be selected for the role of Dr. Phlox. Berman described Billingsley as an in-demand talent and he was right. The future Doctor of the Enterprise had been in two movies and two TV shows to include Roswell and The West Wing just prior to joining Enterprise. The chief medical officer on Enterprise was a Denobulan member of the Interspecies Medical Exchange. Phlox was initially brought on board Enterprise to care for the Klingon passenger during the show's first mission. Afterward, he volunteered to stay on delighting in the experience of humanity taking its first steps onto the galactic stage. Producers wanted a wise and dependable character to balance the young crew and its first time captain. He would end up being an ear for Captain Archer to bend and a sense of reassurance and strength for the rest of the crew members. When Berman and Braga thought about the first Enterprise, they wanted something that felt like a submarine. They figured early Starfleet vessels would be the antithesis of the luxury of other starships. They took designer Herman Zimmerman down to Naval Base San Diego and were able to get on a couple submarines and get the feel for what it's like to be confined to such a small space. The design that Herman came up with does have the feel and look of a submarine. As a result, the Enterprise NX-01 was born. The network wanted them to spruce up the ship and add color, but the showrunners felt like it would take away from what they were going for. They wanted a ship that looked like a realistic precursor of Captain Kirk's Enterprise, but also had to be interesting and something that Star Trek fans would find exciting. The Enterprise NX-01 was the first completely digital Star Trek main ship and was the first to be depicted without the creation of a practical model. According to illustrator and CGI designer Doug Drexler, he had a concept for the development of Enterprise that was never used on the show. At the end of the fourth season, after being out there dealing with unknowns, the ship would be upgraded based on everything the crew had learned. While the show ended after four seasons, Drexler did later assist in the production of a retrofitted Enterprise model for Star Trek The Official Starships Collection. It also appeared in Star Trek Ships of the Line calendar. It's been a long road. Perhaps the most divisive thing about Star Trek Enterprise for fans was the show's theme song. Some fans love it, while others absolutely can't stand it. Berman knew he wanted the opening of this show to be different than the normal Star Trek Flying Through Stars intro. He wanted an artful animation of the opening to be a compilation of science and the people who led up to spaceflight. The show's effects people created a visual montage, and Berman wanted to try a theme song for the show. It had never been done before in Star Trek, so he went to composer Diane Warren, who went through a whole bunch of songs. They found a song she had written that the words seemed perfect. The song had originally been performed by Rod Stewart for the soundtrack to the 1998 film Patch Adams. If it sounded familiar the first time you heard it, that's because the song charted at number three on the US Hot Adult Contemporary Tracks and number 60 on the UK Singles Chart. The song was also later covered in 1999 by Susan Ashton for her single in the country music genre. So when English tenor Russell Watson got his chance at it for Enterprise, the song had already been around the block a couple times. The song title was changed to Where My Heart Will Take Me in order to be used as the theme song for the show. It's argued that this contemporary theme song dates the series, unlike other Star Trek shows. Berman admits that having a theme song was a big part of him being stubborn, right or wrong. While Berman said there were fans who loved the song, he felt the majority of fans, or at least the very vocal ones, hated it a lot. He said they didn't feel like you should have lyrics on a Star Trek show. The theme song had become such a point of controversy that going into the third season, the studio asked Berman to redo the song. They would end up keeping the words, but rework the instrumental. To this day, Berman still loves the opening, although many fans still do not. Despite how people feel about it, the song would end up being used on four occasions as wake-up calls on board space shuttle missions and was performed by Watson at the 2002 Commonwealth Games. Watson also recorded a special version of the song to be played for the final wake-up of the New Horizons Exploration spacecraft in 2014. The music wasn't the only standard Star Trek thing Berman wanted to change. He felt that every show and movie they had done had Star Trek in the title. Wouldn't it be nice to get rid of Star Trek from the title as they embraced this new show? A lot of people didn't like it, but Berman's reasoning was pretty sound. As if people wouldn't know a show called Enterprise was a Star Trek show. 
But at the end of the second season when ratings were falling and UPN was considering canceling the series, a fan letter campaign made Paramount executives reconsider and instead asked Berman to put Star Trek back up in front of the title. They also wanted a new action-oriented plot, which resulted in the development of the Zindi. Berman noted that there was a slight improvement in the ratings, but not enough to really move the meter. It became obvious that there was more wrong with the show than its name. Rock and roll is here to stay. Better to burn out than to fade away. So what's the real reason Enterprise struggled to find its way in the first few seasons? It certainly wasn't the idea. Revisiting the time between First Contact and Kirk when Starfleet was young and the Federation was forming is fascinating for any Star Trek fan. It could have worked. They had good actors who were committed to the show. There's no reason Enterprise couldn't go seven seasons and see as much success as its predecessors. But there was one problem. The creatives were totally burnt out. As we said earlier, Braga had already walked away from Trek, and Berman had begged the studio to give a breather before launching a new series after Voyager. Berman may have thought he was asking for the fans, but he was really asking for him and his team. After more than 500 episodes of Star Trek, Berman was burnt out, and he was in danger of just fading away. After an interesting and well-made pilot, Enterprise would blast off to the stars, and its writers would fall to Earth. If you were looking for warning signs, start with the theme song and the title of the show. Berman wanted to do things differently. He was turning Enterprise into new Coke, and we all know how that went. Initial complaints of the show were that it was boring. A good sign that the writer's room needs to be refreshed is when you attempt to redo the worst episode from the show you were previously on. The Enterprise episode Extinction features members of the crew mutating into lizard people before being brought back to normal. Star Trek fans remembered the oft-voted worst episode of Voyager entitled Threshold, which featured Captain Janeway and Tom Paris mutating into salamanders and making babies. Yeah, it was as bad as it sounds. Braga wanted to redeem the previously bad episode from Voyager that he had been a part of. The problem was, Extinction is now often found on many of the same worst Star Trek episode lists. LeVar Burton, who played Geordi LaForge on The Next Generation, directed the episode and said he was ashamed to have been involved with it at all. Not all the episodes leading into season three were bad. There just wasn't enough consistent good writing to keep fans interested. Viewer numbers would continue to drop. It became apparent that Jolene Blaylock was unhappy with how her character to Paul was being portrayed. She wanted to emulate Spock, but as she would describe, the writers were continuously making her emotional and very unvulcan like She wanted the show to appeal to viewers' intellect, and she wanted her character to seem real and consistent. Instead, the studio and producers were giving her different uniforms that showed more cleavage. In an interview during the show's production, she said she can't play a Vulcan who doesn't behave like one you might as well clip the ears. She remembers an episode where the writers wanted her to eat popcorn with her hands. She said, Vulcans don't eat with their hands. She wanted to use a napkin, but they wouldn't let her. Many Star Trek shows have struggled to find itself in the first couple seasons, but could Enterprise survive to find its space legs? When the Twin Towers fell in New York City on September, the entire tone of the United States changed. It went to bed one night believing that terrorism happened way over there, only to wake up to it knocking at the door. A nation who felt safe at home was no longer sure they were. Enterprise would debut 15 days later. According to Bakula, they were filming when that happened, and it changed the entire direction of the show. Bakula said the show would go on to mirror what was happening following 9-11, and all of a sudden the story became about finding the people who attacked Earth and chase them down wherever that led in the universe. Going into season three, the ratings were so bad, the studio came to Berman and Braga and asked them what they could do to fix the rating problem for season three. After a great deal of consideration, they came up with a story that would change the show from episodic to a season-long story arc. The change did give a small improvement to the ratings, but not to the extent the studio had hoped for. But the change had a tremendous effect on the characters. Captain Archer became much tougher and was forced to make more difficult decisions. The whole cast had a new edge to them. 
It was a reflection of what was happening in America, and some of the questionable choices Captain Archer was about to make would also reflect how far Americans were willing to go to fight terrorism. And in the third season of Enterprise, the Zindi attacked Earth, attempting to terminate humans, and it was up to Archer and his crew to confront them and find the weapon that would destroy our world. Art was indeed imitating life. Enterprise was considered for cancellation at the end of the second season, but the third season was very nearly the end. When it was renewed, there was a genuine surprise. Enterprise had 75 episodes, and at that time, if a show had 100 episodes, it was much more valuable. The studio went to UPN and asked them into going one more season. To sweeten the deal, the studio agreed to lower the license fee per episode, and UPN agreed to the fourth season. But the decision wasn't made in the hopes the show would make a sudden turnaround and make it to seven seasons like other Star Trek shows before it. Can you pinpoint its location? The frequency scramble. It also moved the show to the Friday night death slot. This graveyard slot in American television ran from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it meant a show was likely to be canceled. At that time, young Americans rarely watched television on Friday and Saturday nights, so by removing that demographic, you were essentially telling advertisers, this isn't the show you want. Today, with on-demand streaming, it doesn't really matter, but in 2005, network TV was still king, and almost nothing would save Enterprise. That said, one guy tried like hell. Manny Cotto had come into the writing staff during season three. Keating remembers reading one of his early scripts and thinking, wow, this was really great. It was so good, he called him right away to tell him. Cotto was a huge fan of Star Trek the original series. His work in season three put a spotlight on the fact that both Braga and Berman were burnt out. The pair who co-created the series would take a step back in the fourth season and Cotto became the showrunner. Cotto described the situation as having three showrunners, with the other two giving notes and feedback. But in a 2007 interview, Braga admitted franchise management made the call. And if the show could have been saved, you can bet Manny would have saved it. But Enterprise was the Titanic, and Les Moonves was the iceberg. We'll get to that in a moment. Cotto's work on season four was lauded by Braga, who said he thought Manny did a great job. It was the best season of Enterprise, and one could argue that it should have been that way from the beginning. Braga said if Enterprise had continued, it would have kept going with Manny's unique vision of the show. Cotto, knowing this was the final season of the series, wanted to tie up as many loose ends as possible to connect the show with the original series, which was still 90 years in the future. Cotto was able to bring to the canon things fans loved. He was able to set up storylines that fans of the original series knew would be paid off in the Kirk and Spock era. Berman explained that Cotto created storylines that essentially tied into the original series and the fans loved it. Whether it was explaining why Klingon's looks changed or exploring what became of the augments between the eugenics wars and the return of Khan, Cotto was doing everything he could to tie Enterprise to TOS. He even told the story of how the threat of the Romulans helped give birth to the Federation. From who created the transporter, to including an appearance of an original series era Constitution class ship, and a look at those classic TOS uniforms, Kodo pulled out all the stops. Star Trek legend Brent Spiner, who played Data on The Next Generation, showed up to play Eric Soon, a predecessor to Data's creator, showing how the augment story would eventually lead to the focus of cybernetics and eventually Data. Season four would be a love letter to the original series fans. Kodo described the experience as the highlight of his life, saying he would have given up a son if he had been given the chance to work on Enterprise from the start, and that he would have died a happy man if he could have been allowed to work on nothing else for the remainder of his life had the franchise continued. Current Star Trek writers, take note. Look at the trouble you've gotten your pink skin into this time. It would be impossible to do a definitive history about Star Trek Enterprise without including Jeffrey Combs. The versatile actor played eight different characters on three Star Trek series, but none more notable than the cranky Andorian Thylek Shran on Enterprise. Although not a regular cast member for the show, it was rumored he would have become a regular had there been a season five. Shran would have likely become an Andorian advisor to the Enterprise, taking his pink skin insults to new highs. Combs' introduction to Star Trek was waiting to audition for the role of Will Riker in Star Trek The Next Generation. Combs laughs about the memory, saying, everyone auditioned for Riker. Jonathan Frakes would eventually get the role, 
Combs would get other roles reuniting with Frakes various times throughout his appearances on Star Trek, but ironically appeared on screen with Frakes in the Enterprise series finale, which turned out like spoiled milk. But we'll get to that in a moment. When asked how he felt about Enterprise being canceled after four seasons, Combs said, I don't know why people were ambivalent about the show at first. Let's not forget the original series only had three seasons. I feel like Enterprise was just finding its voice and hit its stride when it was canceled. It took time for all the Star Trek series who came before it to find its place. They pulled the trigger too fast and I feel strongly about this. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Season 4 may have been cooking with Crisco, but the show's finale came out of the oven burnt. Upon reflection, both Berman and Braga realized now they made a big mistake. Kodo had managed the season, but Berman and Braga wanted to come back and tie the series up with a big bow. They wanted to send a Valentine's to all Star Trek fans. And this decision really showed how stuck in the past they were and how tone deaf they were about Enterprise in general. The story that the pair would write would focus on two next generation characters, Riker and Troy. Commander Riker went to the holodeck in the 24th century looking for inspiration to help make a difficult personal decision in the future. Riker would end up watching a simulation of the final mission of the original Starship Enterprise commanded by Jonathan Archer. During this episode, Riker would blend into the simulation as the Enterprise's chef. Berman must have been big on the chef because earlier in the series there was a pitch to make Kirk the chef brought in by our resident time traveler Daniels from the future. William Shatner had come in to pitch his own guest episode and when it was declined for this role as the chef, Kodo said there was a long silence and that was the end of that. But doubling down on chef, Berman and Braga thought it would be a great way for Riker to blend into the crew. The bottom line is the finale for Enterprise would end up becoming just another episode of The Next Generation. This wasn't Berman and Braga's intention, but that is exactly what happened. The fans were angry and the cast was angry. Some people felt that it was disrespectful to the crew that they had been following for four seasons to have them essentially be a footnote for the next generation. On top of that, Braga also decided to kill fan favorite Tucker. Braga said Trip was always his favorite character on the show and knowing it was the final episode, he just wanted to kill him. He couldn't really explain why other than he wanted to do something that had emotional impact and consequences because it wasn't something they were ever allowed to do. It didn't go over well with fans either. Enterprise had found its place during season four, but the show would leave many fans unsatisfied at the end. If Enterprise was a candle in the wind, then CBS's president Les Moonves was an incoming storm. The man newly in charge of the fate of everything on his network moving forward despised science fiction in general and hated Star Trek specifically. Enterprise had finally found its voice, but its overall poor ratings performance gave Moonves the justification he needed to end Star Trek's 18 year run on television. The series was canceled on February 3rd, 2005. The cast and crew were on the sixth day of production of In a Mirror Darkly. After 650 hours of Star Trek on television, the run was over. Although the movie reboots would begin in 2009, it would be over 12 years before a new Star Trek series would come to TV. As Star Trek fans are known to do, they protested the cancellation both in person at Paramount Pictures and online. TrekUnited.com was set up to raise funds for a fifth season, but when it didn't materialize, the money was returned to donors. A mind-boggling $32 million was raised. Not everyone was unhappy with the cancellation. Braga told a group of students shortly after the news that the current run of Star Trek is over and that's a good thing. It needs a rest. Although eight years later in 2013, Braga brought up the idea that fans could prompt Netflix into producing a fifth season of the show. A Facebook campaign was set up to promote the idea, but nothing ever came of it. The cast would move on to do other things. Notably, many of them would go on to guest star in Stargate episodes. Bakula would eventually find new long-term shows in Chuck and NCIS New Orleans. But for many actors on the show, Enterprise would end up being the most notable thing they ever did. While we didn't get a fifth season of the show, that doesn't mean there wasn't a plan for one. Kodo had been busy making plans despite the unlikely event it would be renewed. He was expecting to take the show and cover the buildup of the Romulan War. He also wanted to continue the link to TOS with references to things such as the Cloud City of Stratos, as well as a mini-series of four or five episodes devoted to following up on the events of In a Mirror Darkly. As stated before, Jeffrey Combs' Shran would also become a series regular. 
But one of the loose ends that never does get tied up in Enterprise is who was Future Guy. You remember the mysterious individual who acted as the benefactor of the Cabal in his role as the representative for a faction of the temporal Cold War. The character was unable to physically travel through time and could only partially materialize from the 28th century. This unseen leader of the Suliban from the future was manipulating the past, and fans had begun theorizing that the figure must be a character who was already established, and the primary suspect was a future version of Jonathan Archer. In 2009, Kodo and Braga stated Future Guy was probably going to be a future Romulan trying to instigate things. But in 2012, Braga revealed that if there was going to be a fifth season, Future Guy would have been Jonathan Archer trying to correct history and repair a corrupt future by influencing his younger self. Braga also said Archer being future guy was the plan from the beginning and any mention of a Romulan was meant to be a red herring. But we're going to learn from those mistakes. That's what being human is all about. Today, Enterprise is looked upon much more fondly than it had when it first came out. Perhaps you can't miss something until it's truly gone. Following the release of Star Trek's Discovery and Picard, people online put out comments like, you appreciate Enterprise a lot more now, don't you? Or, I guess it wasn't as bad as you thought. While Enterprise doesn't usually rank at the top of fan favorite Star Trek series polls, it's played a big part in the big picture of the Star Trek universe. It went on to spawn books, and you can find the NX-01 and its crew in video games. The Enterprise crew are fan favorites at any convention, and aren't afraid to sign autographs and stir the pot a bit about their abbreviated time on the Star Trek stage. Enterprise may have been limited by UPN, and unceremoniously canceled before its time, but there is no doubt that the show has cemented its place in Star Trek history, and the universe is better because it was made. What do you think? Did you like Enterprise or not so much? Did you like it better now, years later? Do you think it was canceled before its time, or did they let it go on too long? How does it compare to current Trek? Who was your favorite character, and did we get enough shirtless Tucker scenes? Let's talk about it in the comments below. Also, check out this incredible NX-01-inspired graphic design from the amazing artists at MixedTees.com. Get 20% off your purchase by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. Here's to the next generation.